I am delighted to welcome Dr. Tammy Barrett of the Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, winner of the 2023 Fleming Prize. The Fleming Prize is named after Sir Alexander Fleming, the founder and first president of the Microbiology Society, and is awarded to an early career researcher who has achieved an outstanding research record. Tammy is an exceedingly worthy recipient. His lab studies cell surfaces of prokaryotes at the atomic level using electron tomography and associated techniques. Surface molecules mediate cellular interactions with the environment, playing important roles in key processes including cell adhesion, biofilm formation, and antibiotic tolerance in pathogenic bacteria. Tammy will provide as a talk today on the structural studies of prokaryotic cell surfaces. I welcome Tammy. Well, t first of all, thank you so much to the society for selecting me for this award. And um, also I have to say the work that I'm gonna present today is the result of the hard work of several of my laboratory members over the past few years. And I'm just a person here uh, receiving it, but they deserve the sp spotlight as much as I do. So um, we study cell surface molecules uh, of prokaryotic cells, including bacteria and archaea. And they are extremely important because surface molecules mediate all interactions of a cell with its immediate environment. And also these interactions shape the formation of multicellular communities, including biofilms and microbiomes. So it's extremely important. One of the main problems studied by my laboratory is how bacteria form biofilms. And this is not something I think I need to introduce in great detail to this audience, but very briefly, biofilm formation begins when a planktonic uh, bacteria adheres to a surface, which can be an abiotic surface or a surface provided by a host tissue uh, in the case of infection. Um, growth and expansion of the adhered bacteria into a multicellular community uh, is accompanied by the secretion of an extracellular matrix into which these bacteria are embedded. And this together is known as a biofilm. Biofilms are a fundamental mode of bacterial existence on this planet that's comparatively understudied. Uh, therefore, it's very important to study this problem and also it's biomedically relevant because many, if not most, um, uh, human infections proceed with biofilm formation. The model organism of our laboratory is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is an important human pathogen which was listed by the World Health Organization as a priority one pathogen against which antibiotics must be urgently developed. Also recently, it's uh, been shown to be one of the top um, bacteria uh, leading to um, um, uh, patient mortality which are antibiotic resistant in this recent study in the Lancet Journal. And one of the main um, uh, methods by which Pseudomonas evades antibiotics is by forming biofilms. So therefore, it's very important to study biofilms to understand how this occurs. So, all, so the defining characteristic of all biofilms is the presence of an extracellular matrix around which the bacteria, uh, into which the bacteria are embedded. And it is the hallmark of all biofilms uh, and it contains cell surface molecules and other proteinaceous filaments uh, which combine with uh, polysaccharides, DNA, and lipid. It, despite its importance, um, the general organization and principles of this extracellular matrix are very poorly understood, which means that we don't understand uh, biofilms at the molecular and atomic level. To bridge this gap in our knowledge, our laboratory tries to understand how cell surface molecules are arranged within the extracellular matrix, how these cell surface molecules allow the bacteria to adhere to one another, and how do molecules in, on the cell surface and in the extracellular matrix provide the bacteria with several advantages. Most importantly, how do, how do they allow the bacteria to tolerate large doses of antibiotics? As mentioned in the introduction, uh, we use electron microscopy as the primary technique to study this problem, and which is a very versatile tool because it allows us to address the problem at multiple scales. We use cryo-electron microscopy to solve structures of cell surface molecules that are important in the extracellular matrix. We place these atomic structures that we solve uh, in the context of cells and biofilms by high-resolution electron microscopy imaging. 
Just to give you an example, uh, this, uh, the first project I will present is about an adhesin present in the extracellular matrix of Pseudomonas aeruginosa called CDRA. This adhesin is um, held in the outer membrane of Pseudomonas bacteria, and it contains several repeat domains in the C-terminal part of the protein that protrude from the cell surface. On the N-terminal side of the protein, there's uh, an adhesive domain that binds to matrix polysaccharides. Now, the expression of this molecule has profound consequences on Pseudomonas. So on the right here is a normal bacterial culture, uh, which is cloudy. If you overexpress CDRA, the cells spontaneously flocculate and form these biofilm-like aggregates in solution, leading to this clear appearance of this tube. So what happens at the molecular level leading to this phenotype? So we studied this using electron microscopy, and this is a Pseudomonas aeruginosa cell that's expressing CDRA. If we zoom in to the cell surface, we see these uh, protruding molecules, which we thought corresponding to CDRA. They have a, a thin stalk-like base and a bulbous uh, tip, giving the rough appearance of a matchstick. We purified these um, um, matchstick-shaped molecules from these Pseudomonas biofilms, and using biochemistry, Western blotting, and mass spectrometry, we identified these molecules as CDRA, confirming our uh, observations on whole cells. As I mentioned previously, we take a multi-scale approach to studying this problem. So we also wanted to understand how these CDRA molecules are making cell-cell junctions within the extracellular matrix. And we leverage high-resolution electron microscopy techniques uh, to, to achieve this. So here, we have deposited these biofilm-like flocules on electron microscopy grids. Then using a technique no, known as focused ion beam milling, we made um, a thin sections through this biofilm using, using an ion beam. Uh, and these thin sections are amenable for cryo-electron microscopy imaging, allowing us to look at the native cell-cell um, junctions within these uh, uh, aggregates. So uh, performing this experiment, we found that CDRA molecules are present in these cell-cell junctions, and somehow they mediate uh, formation of these, uh, so they allow the bacteria to adhere to one another. This is actually a very nice example because it shows the kind of research our laboratory does from uh, inside the test tube to, to whole cells and to uh, the native uh, case of biofilms. Now, can we use the information that we've uh, uncovered using our imaging approaches to understand, to dig deeper into the mechanistic basis of cell-cell junction formation? And can we use it to develop ideas for therapeutic intervention? So here, we have raised uh, uh, single-domain antibodies or nanobodies that target CDRA. And one such nanobody was shown to bind to CDRA in a one is to one ratio, shown here by this native mass spectrum performed by our collaborator, Carl Robinson. We coupled this nanobody to um, um, small gold particles to understand where it binds to CDRA molecule. And this experiment showed that this inhibitory nanobody bound to the very tip of CDRA, 70 nanometers away from the cell surface, which was obviously uh, not seen in the control. So we thought that this, um, because the adhesive domain uh, is at the very tip of CDRA, we thought this might affect the ability of the molecule to bind to matrix polysaccharides. To test this, we performed um, bacterial killing assay. So this is in collaboration with George O'Toole's group at Dartmouth. So uh, in blue are the bacteria that are alive, and in red are the bacteria that are dead. So, as the, uh, so this is in a microfluidic setup. As the experiment runs, the bacteria are all challenged by a sublethal dose of cholestin. When we don't apply any further treatment to the bacteria, the bacteria proliferate very nicely. But when we apply the nanobody uh, at various points of time, we can efficiently kill the bacteria with this sublethal dose, meaning that something is being affected um, in this biofilm setup. So this is just the data plotted from that uh, microscopy experiment. And this is what um, we think is happening. CDRA forms cell-cell junctions by uh, bridging different cells through binding to this matrix polysaccharides. When we apply the nanobody, this binding is uh, prevented, uh, partially disassembling the cells from the biofilm, allowing the antibiotic to go in and kill the bacteria. Um, so this is just another uh, just this is the first example showing how we can use the fundamental information that we generate in our laboratory 
to develop ideas for um, uh, potentially treating these uh, bacterial infections in the future. I should also mention that we are also developing small molecules inhibitors uh, against CDRA in collaboration with AstraZeneca now. Okay, so now the cells have formed a junction and they were adhered to one another. How, does the, uh, how is the matrix stabilized in a biofilm? So Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, secretes several proteinaceous molecules, uh, including the so-called chaperone usher pili, to, uh, to cross-link the extracellular matrix and to stabilize the biofilm. One such chaperone usher pili is called um, cup, is cup E, and this is in collaboration with Alain Filou laboratory. We wanted to understand how this um, filamentous um, uh, pili stabilizes the biofilm. So we purified these pilus molecules and solved the atomic structure and found a classical donor strand arrangement of, um, of the filaments. This arrangement has been seen previously in pili of E. coli, uh, solved by Gabriel Waxman's group, and leads to a very interconnected and stable arrangement of the individual monomers. Um, so we imaged these uh, pili on the surface of Pseudomonas cells, and we saw that individual pilus molecules protrude from Pseudomonas aeruginosa cells, and they're extremely long, meaning that they can engage their target far away from the originator cell, and they're extremely, um, um, extremely bendy, meaning that they can uh, go into the extracellular matrix, cross-link it, and presumably stabilize the biofilm, uh, which has been shown previously by genetic uh, and um, imaging experiments. Other important components of the extracellular matrix include the so-called functional amyloids that are present in both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. We don't have the structure of the functional amyloid of Pseudomonas, so I'm just going to switch to a functional amyloid from a gram-positive system of Bacillus subtilis, where functional amyloid uh, filaments uh, forming of, uh, formed of the TAS A protein is an important component of the extracellular matrix. So we solved the atomic structure of this um, functional amyloid um, um, and found that it's not really very amyloid-like and it showed the same kind of donor strand complemented um, structure um, that stabilizes the filament. This leads to a highly interconnected arrangement and um, um, provides this filament with the ability to resist proteases and other um, environmental stresses. Now these filamentous molecules can bundle into higher order structures by long range lateral interactions. These long range interactions depend on avidity effects and lead to a highly stabilized arrangement that make micron scaled objects in the extracellular matrix. So going from a single protein, which donates a beta strand to make a very stable filament, these filaments can form very stable bundles, and these bundles form a very important parts of the extracellular matrix shown here by uh, this AFM imaging and by our cryo-EM imaging. What we believe is that a similar mechanism as, is at play in other functional amyloids, including Pseudomonas aeruginosa, where single filaments uh, emanating from different cells can bundle and stabilize the extracellular matrix, uh, at, and at the same time, tethering different cells with each other uh, as the biofilm develops. Okay, so now the, the matrix has been stabilized. So how does um, cells within the biofilm acquire certain characteristics, such as the ability to uh, resist or tolerate large doses of antibiotics? Again, we looked in the literature, um, and we found several studies pointing um, to a particular uh, prophage that's encoded in the Pseudomonas genome. So this is a microarray study where um, the expression of cells within a biofilm were compared against planktonic bacteria. And the highest upregulation seen was in a prophage known as PF. This prophage has been implicated in providing antibiotic tolerance to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And it also provides other advantages to Pseudomonas, for example, it fools the human immune system to launching an antiviral response at the site of uh, wound infections or other infections, allowing the bacteria to proliferate. We wanted to understand in particular how this uh, uh, prophage, uh, genes of this phage, allows the bacteria to tolerate antibiotics. 
So using a similar approach, we solve the atomic structure of this phage. I'm not gonna go into um, great detail about the atomic structure, but the atomic structure shows that it's uh, made of an alpha helical capsid protein that encapsidates a single-stranded uh, DNA genome. What's relevant for this talk is that these phage molecules are secreted into the extracellular matrix of Pseudomonas biofilms, where they uh, can bind to biopolymers, including sodium alginate, which is secreted by the bacteria, or other polymers that are present in uh, human airways, for example, hyaluronin, and form higher order structures um, that look like that. So these are lens-shaped liquid crystalline droplets, which form spontaneously when these two, um, uh, when the phage is mixed with these biopolymers. So this is electron tomography imaging, um, um, uh, which shows that within these um, liquid crystalline droplets, the phage molecules are orientationally ordered, but their position is uh, relatively random, which is uh, the defining characteristic of a pneumatic liquid crystalline phase. This is uh, what the chemists would call that, and, and the chemists would actually call this a tactoid. But what's essential here for this talk is that these liquid crystalline droplets protect the bacteria from antibiotics. So this is a bacterial survival assay against many different antibiotics. So if no treatment is applied, the bacteria obviously survive. When we apply an antibiotic, the bacteria are killed. But when we uh, put into the mixture these liquid uh, crystals, meaning we add the biopolymer and the phage, we get an antibiotic protective effect, which has been seen by several laboratories. So we wanted to understand how, um, what's actually going on. So being microscopists, we just uh, looked and, uh, to see what's going on. What we found was a bit of a surprise. These liquid crystalline droplets seem to encapsulate bacteria, forming effectively a shield around them, somehow protecting them from antibiotics. This is again an electron tomography image where you can see that the liquid crystal, uh, crystalline droplet associates tightly with the bacteria. The phage molecules themselves are extremely pleomorphic and in some cases even uh, bend to wrap around entire bacterial cells. Now the association of these liquid crystalline droplets with the bacteria is not random. Um, we believe that the lens shape of these liquid crystals matches very well with the rod shape of the bacteria. And if we uh, um, measure the orientational difference between the long axis of the lens shape with the rod shape of the bacteria, uh, this just shows that they are oriented in the same way. Now this is an experiment which shows that encapsulation of the bacteria is tightly linked to its survival. So in addition to tagging the uh, phage molecules with a green fluorophore, we also um, uh, label the dead bacteria uh, in blue here. So in both experiments, so the control and the actual experiment, we've challenged the bacteria uh, with an antibiotic. And what we saw in this experiment is that bacteria that were encapsulated by the liquid crystalline droplet were protected against the antibiotic, whereas bacteria that were not uh, encapsulated by the liquid crystalline droplet were preferentially killed, showing that encapsulation is linked to bacterial survival in our assay. Again, this is another example of the kind of work a laboratory does. We combine uh, information from atomic structures to in vitro reconstituted systems uh, and advanced imaging to help us understand the mechanistic basis of um, biological processes related to biofilm formation. At this point, we wanted to probe the mechanistic basis of antibiotic tolerance um, in these phage liquid crystalline droplets. Here we turn to a, another phage that's um, heavily studied. Uh, it's the FD phage from E. coli, which is quite controversial because several different atomic structures for this phage have been reported over the last few years. I know not everyone in the audience is a structure biologist, but I think you can appreciate that these, all these structures are extremely different and all of them can't be the truth. So, um, um, <laughs> And also FD phage is very uh, important because it's famously been used for phage display, uh, for the development of phage display. So we wanted to use this, this phage as a biochemical tool to understand uh, the basis of antibiotic tolerance provided by this uh, liquid crystals. So we solved the atomic structure of the phage. 
And um, the structure, I mean, there's not, not, not much to say there. It's uh, alpha helical uh, capsid. Uh, but when comparing the structure of this phage uh, to the previous structure I presented of PF4, what's um, important here for the re uh, rest, rest of the slides is that um, the surface biochemistry of the FT phage is markedly different to the PF4 phage. Another important point to mention is that the FD phage is much uh, shorter than PF4, less than a micron long, whereas the PF4 phages are more than three microns long. So they, there's morphological differences between the phages. These differences lead to formation of um, very different kinds of um, liquid crystalline droplets. So FD phages form uh, fatter droplets with a smaller aspect ratio. And this has been studied uh, in great detail in the past. So FD uh, is a poster child for the study of liquid crystalline droplets uh, in the physical chemistry field, for example. And if you go down to the molecular level and look in electron tomography, we can see that the packing of these phages uh, within these liquid crystalline droplets is quite different. So there's uh, heavily packed FD phages compared to the PF4 phages that are um, not as densely packed. When we mix these um, liquid crystalline droplets, it doesn't matter what the source, PF or FD liquid crystalline droplets with Pseudomonas aeruginosa cell, what we found was something slightly surprising. They all associated with bacteria, albeit in slightly different ways. When we changed the bacterium, uh, we changed Pseudomonas for E. coli, we saw the same thing. All of these rod-shaped bacteria seem to associate with these liquid crystalline droplets, which to us was very surprising because we thought that the PF liquid crystalline droplet was uh, kind of tailor-made for a particular task. So then we repeated our antibiotic survival assay, and we found that just the presence of, of a liquid crystal was enough to provide the bacteria with an anti uh, antibiotic protection. So it didn't matter which rod-shaped bacteria we used. It didn't matter which liquid crystalline droplet we used, PF or FD. The presence of these liquid crystalline droplets protected the bacteria from antibiotics. And we believe we are seeing something, the effect that's seen in an extracellular matrix of a biofilm, which contains all these filamentous molecules. Just to summarize, uh, we've used um, different filamentous molecules to make some kind of phase-separated object that associates with these rod-shaped bacteria, and all of it seem to provide an antibiotic uh, protection. And we believe we are onto something important here, and uh, as we try and reconstitute um, larger and larger components of the extracellular matrix. Okay, so if this provides protection, what happens if we disrupt them? So using the same strategy, we raised antibodies against these uh, PF uh, phages. We raised a monoclonal uh, antibody and a nanobody that targeted this phage. Both these antibodies bound to PF4, uh, shown in this um, uh, phage pelletation assay, the nanobody as well as the monoclonal antibody. And both these uh, binders prevented encapsulation of um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa by these liquid crystalline droplets, um, probably by uh, preventing the liquid crystalline droplet to form. Okay, so these are all in vitro cases. What happens in a biofilm? So now go going back to our microfluidics based um, uh, biofilm setup in Georgia Tools Group. If we grow the biofilm and we challenge it with a sublethal dose of tobramycin, nothing really happens. But when we apply uh, the nanobody that binds to PF4, we can efficiently potentiate the killing of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, meaning somehow we remove the ability of Pseudomonas aeruginosa to tolerate these high doses of antibiotics. Okay, I hope I've shown you how with um, uh, taking different systems, purifying them, and understanding uh, the biochemistry, we are trying to understand how the extracellular matrix of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and other bacteria are arranged. And we combine this with in-situ imaging, where we can look at entire um, biofilms to hopefully move from these cartoon-like representations of biofilms to something that's um, uh, actual data where we can place each and every individual molecule within this space. And um, 
what we do is a clearly basic science, but uh, we are interfacing with clinicians and also with the industry to uh, hopefully take ideas forward for therapeutic interventions in the future. So at this point, I'd like to switch gears a little bit. So um, when I started my lab, uh, biofilms were the only thing that we really worked on. And uh, one part of my, well, one person in my lab um, wanted to study prokaryotic surface layers to develop methods to solve um, high resolution structures of molecules on the surface of cells. Uh, that project has led to us discovering a lot of new biology, and I was given a lot of um, encouragement by my um, director, Matthew Freeman, of the Dunn School, whom I have to um, uh, acknowledge. And it's becoming a bigger and bigger part of my laboratory. So I don't know if probably many of you know, but I'll just tell anyway. Most prokaryotic cells, including archaea, gram-positive bacteria, and gram-negative bacteria, are covered by a paracrystalline array of um, lattice-forming molecules, uh, which is called a surface layer or an S layer. These S layers have been discovered several decades ago. Uh, shortly after electron microscopes were utilized for visualizing biological material. And they form these beautiful two-dimensional arrays on the surface of cells. These S layers are nearly ubiquitous. So this is, um, this is a cleanse map, so I will explain that. So um, each dot represents a sequence of an S layer protein that we've detected bioinformatically. And the distance between the dots represents the evolutionary distance between them, measured by a figure of merit, such as BLAST. And by our estimation, uh, more than 80% of all archaea contain an S layer, and the majority of bacteria can also possess an S layer. They're just not present on the model organisms like E. coli or Bacillus subtilis. Therefore, perhaps they have not been studied um, in great detail in the past. And also, in the past, there weren't methods available to solve the atomic structures of these S layers. Perhaps this is why, even though the field was quite um, vibrant in the 80s and the 90s, now it's uh, gone out of fashion. And hopefully, with this talk, uh, some people will come back to it. So the first project I would like to tell you about is uh, the S layer of a gram-negative bacterium called Colobacter crescentus. It's a model organism in the, uh, in the gram-negative bacterial field because uh, the bacterium has, um, uh, has crescent-shaped cells with an appendage known as a stalk. Each cell division is asymmetric, leading to the formation of a swarmer cell and an adhered um, stalked cell. Um, when we image these cells with electron tomography and look at the cell surface, we can see the inner membrane, the peptidoglycan layer, the outer membrane, and uh, another layer, which is the S layer, or the surface layer. And this is the layer that we wanted to originally study just for method development, but now we've studied it, um, we've uncovered a lot of biology, and therefore we are studying a lot more of it. So this is uh, the end of a Colobacter crescentus cell. Uh, the body of the cell, as well as the stalk, is covered by this pseudo-hexagonal S layer. And uh, uh, yeah, there's just a tomogram through the entire cell. If we stick stills from the movie, we can see on top of the cell, this characteristic pseudo-hexagonal pattern made by this S layer. And from the side, we can see that the S layer is positioned uh, not directly proximal to the outer membrane, but it's uh, present 18 nanometers away from the outer membrane and is functionally organized into two domains, the inner domain that putatively binds to LPS and the outer domain that forms the lattice. Now this S layer is made up of a single protein called RSAA which has a um, very non-canonical amino acid sequence, highly enriched in alanine and threonine residues. So we wanted to solve the structure of this S layer, and now I'm going to summarize a lot of uh, experiments in very few slides. So what we did was we, we purified this S layer protein from colobacter cells, we reconstituted this S layer in the test tube, and we can visualize these S layers using electron tomography. And then we can take these two-dimensional crystals, make three-dimensional, stack them up to make three-dimensional crystals from them, and use X-ray crystallographies to solve the structure of the S layer. 
We couldn't quite crystallize the entire S layer. We crystallized a C terminal uh, bit of the S layer. And uh, this X ray structure shows that the S layer protein uh, it makes a right handed beta helix. Um, and it's bound to several functionally relevant calcium ions, which we showed using long wavelength X ray diffraction uh, experiments. And I'm very glad that the first author of this paper is somewhere in the audience and also gave a talk earlier. Um, so that's a matter of great pride to me, for me that uh, we are able to um, engage this community. Okay, so that's the outer bit of the protein. What about the anchoring of the uh, S layer to the cell? So the S layer is anchored to the cell through the LPS. I don't think I need to explain what LPS is to this audience, but very quickly, the LPS contains a lipid A part buried in the outer membrane, which is connected to, the, uh, um, uh, to some core oligosaccharides that link onto a repeating O antigen that reaches out from the cell surface. We purified the inner domain of the protein um, um, in collaboration with Eve Brunn's group, and then we reconstituted a complex with the LPS. This is what the complex looks like. Uh, so what had happened uh, was that um, the protein had oligomerized on the O antigen chains into a superhelix, but what it clearly shows is that the inner domain binds to LPS in a calcium dependent manner, which we uh, verified by native mass spectrometry, biochemical methods, and also molecular dynamic simulations, which I don't have time to go into detail. Now this is the speciality of our group, and also this is why the whole project started. Uh, we wanted to solve structures of molecules directly on the surface of cells. Um, so here is the structure of the Colobacter crescentus S layer. We've definitely utilized the thin um, nature of the stalk to solve the structure. In the, atomic, uh, in the structure from the cell, we can dock in our uh, X-ray structure, as well as our cryo-EM structure. There is a clear density present in our cellular structure at the exact same location where the O antigen uh, is bound, confirming all our in vitro data. Now one would say, why is it important to solve structures in a cellular context if you can do it all purified? Um, well, the answer is sometimes there are uh, surprises. So in our cellular structure, for example, we see a second uh, LPS binding site, which is not as, um, as dominant as the original binding site that we'd seen in our in vitro reconstituted system. And of course, this structure was don done on the thin stalk of Colobacter crescentus. Uh, since um, this paper has been out, now we can repeat this and uh, get uh, structures with better resolution from whole cells as well. Okay, having described the atomic structure of the S layer, we wanted to understand how this S layer is uh, assembled for this. One of our collaborators, Caroline Aho Franklin's group in Berkeley, um, uh, they engineered um, a mutant of this S layer to express a uh, amino acid tag called a spy tag, which could be conveniently tagged with a, a spy catcher and a fluorophore, allowing us to follow S layer biogenesis. Now, we are not the only people thinking about it, and uh, so I have to acknowledge other authors, William Murner and Lucy Shapiro, also reported using a diff, uh, S layer labeling using a different method. So, um, this work was done by Matt, Matt Herdman, who's in the audience, um, and it shows that the S layer is inserted um, at the cell poles and at the mid cell of dividing cells. Shown here by this quantification, these are demographs. Each line uh, represents one single bacterium, and it shows that in dividing cells, uh, we have S, um, a new S layer that is tagged in green here, localizing to the mid cell, and in non-dividing cell, the new S layer, which is in green, and the old S layer in magenta, goes to the cell poles. So how does this relate to the cell cycle? So in this experiment, in addition to tagging the old and the new S layer with magenta and green, we've additionally tagged the peptidoglyc new peptidoglycan in a blue color. As has been seen in many different bacteria, uh, new peptidoglycan is always inserted at the mid-cell. So what these demographs shows uh, is that as the cell grows, the new peptidoglycan arrives. When insertion of the new peptidoglycan stops is the point roughly where new S layer starts being inserted. And all of this has been quantified um, using uh, co-localization analysis, which I'm not gonna go into detail. 
So this was quite exciting for us because we were try starting to understand how the S layer um, uh, assembles on cells, but what's actually happening uh, underneath that fluorescent spot? This was the next question we addressed. To answer this, we performed a technique known as correlated light and electron microscopy. So we took uh, Colobacter crescentus cells and we froze them on electron microscopy grids. And in these cryo conditions, we performed light microscopy, allowing us to uh, pinpoint cells that had um, a bona fide uh, insertion of the new S layer. We could take that electron microscopy grid and image it in the electron microscope and then perform tomography and subtomogram averaging at the S layer insertion site. And what we found here was a bit of a surprise, and it maybe shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was to us at the time. What we found was there were gaps in the S layer. So if you, uh, I'll just walk you through this. So there is a continuous S layer here, but if you look at these inner domains, they form a regular pattern roughly 22 nanometers away from each other. You can see clearly there are missing S layer molecules. And here we think we can even see uh, one S layer molecule in the act of insertion into the lattice. So this is uh, Matt and I, uh, uh, my uh, current theory. There are clearly sites of cell growth happening at the cell poles during stock biogenesis and also at the mid-cell where there's new membranes being deposited, new LPS being inserted. This new membranes and new LPS doesn't come pre-coated with an S layer. Therefore, um, gaps appear. And this S layer, um, there's S layer molecules waiting uh, underneath the existing S layer. And this has been shown by William Merner's group that S layer, can, S layer molecules can diffuse on LPS. They go in and simply plug these gaps. So this is our current model. The S layer molecule is secreted by its ABC transporter. It goes into the extracellular milieu where it can bind to calcium ions. So now I'm glossing over a lot of experiments. Binding to calcium allows it to bind to the O antigen and it can bind to O antigen in multiple ways, which I haven't shown you, which is shown by cryo-EM data. It can walk along the LPS um, to the very tip of the O antigen molecules. At the tip of the O antigen molecules, the steric hindrance by this capsule of the bacteria is released, and the outer domain can bind to even more calcium ions and complete the S layer, which we have seen using our correlated light and electron microscopy experiments. So, uh, the last microbiology meeting I attended, many people told me, oh, we don't even draw the S layer in diagrams of our model organism. But I'm glad now we are slowly starting to enter some illustrative examples of um, bacterial cells. Okay, so that could have been the end of the project, but I was given a lot of encouragement to continue this work. So we started looking, uh, are these uh, principles of S layer biogenesis shared by different prokaryotes? It turns out that if we look at archaea, gram-positive bacteria, all of them show, uh, and compare them to gram-negative bacteria, all of them show S-layer insertion at the mid-cell. So is there actually some similarities between these uh, different S-layers? So as, just to remind you, S-layers are nearly ubiquitous and very little is known about them. So we just went and looked in this side of the tree of life. We looked at an archaeal S-layer. So this is the an S layer structure that we solved from an archaeon that's found in the Dead Sea. It's known as Haloferrex volcanii. Like Colobacter crescentus, it forms a hexagonal S layer. This S layer protein is made up of several repeating immunoglobulin-like domains that form this hexagonal lattice. Because it's a hexagonal lattice, there are also um, dimeric and trimeric interactions that stabilize the lattice. And um, compared to the bacterial case, there are very few gaps in this lattice. It's very tightly packed. The S layer, however, like the bacterial case, is extremely pleomorphic because it needs to coat cell membranes with a widely different curvature. For example, uh, during cell division, uh, S layers need to be negatively curved compared to uh, S layers at the cell pole, which need to be positively curved. So naively, at this point, we thought that these S layers are probably also um, inserted at regions of gaps. Again, we were surprised and we were quite wrong. Um, what turns out is that these S layer, this archaeal S layer, coats these cells to near perfect continuity and the S layer is completed by defined pentameric defects that are made of the same S layer protein. 
So we also reconstituted the pentamer and solved it, its atomic structure, which I'm not presenting here due to time constraints. Now also on whole cells, we found that these pentameric defects do complete the S-layer, but these pentameric uh, defects appear to be in regions of high membrane curvature compared to flat regions of the lattice, which is solely made of, seems to be m more populated by the hexamers. So again, this is a surprise. This S-layer is not completed by gaps, but it's rather completed by these pentameric defects that complete the lattice in vesicles and in cells. Now, this is just a schematic of different S-layer proteins in different archaea. Uh, um, and all the immunoglobulin-like domains are highlighted in red. And what you can hopefully appreciate is that these immunoglobulin-like uh, domain containing S-layers, uh, S-layer proteins, are widespread in archaea. So here, we were interested how widespread are these immunoglobulin-containing S-layers. So then we looked again in the tree of life, uh, in, in our uh, bioinformatics analysis, and we could find uh, some kind of uh, bioinformatics signature uh, in an S layer from this organism, which is called Dinococcus radiodurans, it's an evolutionary deep branching bacterium, uh, which is known as the world's toughest bacterium because it was isolated in the Chernobyl nuclear reactor. It can uh, withstand extremely high doses of ionizing radiation, uh, gamma radiation, and it can even survive in outer space for several years. So, um, yeah, it holds the Guinness Book of World Records. So, um, yeah, so this uh, ha is covered by an S-layer, which has been studied by um, several eminent people in the past years. However, there was a controversy in the field. Um, two proteins were, and I'm presenting here because this is a microbiology community, and I really want to uh, clear up this controversy. So there was um, two proteins that were pr um, uh, proposed to form the S-layer, the HPI protein and the SLAP-A protein. So we systematically purified the two proteins and solved the structure. So this is the structure of the SLAP-A protein. And if there's a structure biologist in the audience, you will immediately recognize that this is uh, not um, an S-layer protein. It's actually a trimeric outer membrane uh, barrel protein. I don't know why the movie's not running, but uh, this trimeric barrel is connected uh, through a long coiled coil stalk to an SLH domain that binds to the peptidoglycan. Okay, sorry. Okay, I think this is stopped responding. Um. Okay, I'm just gonna go on. So we deleted this protein from uh, the bacteria, and uh, so we got a deletion from another group and the deletion showed that despite deleting this protein, the S layer is intact. There's some membrane vesicles uh, secreted by the bacterium, but the S layer is intact, so this is not the S layer protein. Okay. Sorry, I think this is not working. Just resetting the machine. Okay, resetting the machine. Okay. Um. No, okay, still doesn't work. Oh, thank you. So this um, uh, protein is part of an outer membrane peptidoglycan connector family that's found in many different bacteria. Um, and actually, uh, the length of the coiled coil segment regulates the distance between the outer membrane and the peptidoglycan. And actually, the distance is um, highly correlated with the length of these coiled coil stalks. So um, I'm just going to speed up a little bit because you lost a bit of time. And I just want to say that this was um, verified independently by cell biology studies by Simonetta Gribaldo's group, who studied a similar protein called OMP-M and deletion of the protein formed uh, the same kind of outer, uh, membranous vesicles um, uh, with no effect on the S layer. Okay, so HPI is the S layer protein, now coming back to the S layer, and this S layer was studied many years ago in Cambridge by Wolfgang Baumeister, and this is, um, um, uh, this is a negatively stained image, shows a beautiful hexagonal lattice. We solved the structure of this S layer and found that this S layer is indeed made of these immunoglobulin-like uh, domains which are arranged in a very different uh, way. 
so it's got several uh, of these immunoglobulin-like domains, which are, um, uh, and one of these immunoglobulin-like domains connect into the adjoining hexamer, leading to a highly interconnected arrangement, uh, giving the lattice hyperstability. In fact, you can take this S layer and boil it in SDS for several hours, and the only thing, I, I, it will have no effect. So it's extremely uh, hardy, and um, perhaps uh, that's explained by the interconnected nature of this S layer. At this point, I would like to say that it's very important to do uh, painstaking research, careful research, and it's very uh, satisfying that something that has been shown using negative stain EM more than 40 years ago has finally been solved and confirms these old data. And this is another proof that this is actually the S-layer protein and of the other uh, SLAP-A protein, which forms an outer membrane peptidoglycan connector. So these immunoglobulin-containing S layers are not only uh, found uh, in archaea, which is shown by my previous S layer structure, but they are also found in these evolutionary deep branching uh, diderm bacteria, like Dinococcus cardioderms. Han Remout's group has solved structures of uh, S layers from gram-positive bacteria that also contain several immunoglobulin-like domains, which is, uh, uh, well, which, uh, which is quite tantalizing because we can uh, propose that this led to the evolution of modern recognition mod modules like the immune system. You can take the uh, immunoglobulin domain from Halopharax volcanii and overlay it with an immunoglobulin domain from the human immune system and overlays extremely well, which uh, allows us to make several um, hypotheses, like an ancestral S layer in an archaeon could have helped in the interactions with uh, bacterium, uh, leading to engulfment and the formation of what are the modern eukaryotic organelles and the evolution of uh, eukaryotic cell. And this is all made possible by these cell surface molecules, just telling again that cell surface molecules are extremely important in shaping these interactions. We've tried to recapitulate that in the laboratory in collaboration, of course. So this is an environmental specimen where um, an archaeon with an S layer is interacting with another archaeon that doesn't contain an S layer. And this symbiotic interaction is very beneficial, allowing these uh, S layer containing bacteria to proliferate much faster. We've even found cases of uh, complete engulfment uh, in an intracellular lifestyle of an archaeon. So this is an archaeon that um, inserts itself into another larger archaeal cell and forms these, um, uh, uh, proliferates inside the cytoplasm and makes new archaea. So it's a completely intracellular lifestyle for this archaeon. Could this have risen to multicellularity? Perhaps. So this is going back to Halopharax volcanii. The cells are usually uh, unicellular, but when we apply a pressure on them, they convert, they do something uh, strange. They go from a unicellular state to this multicellular state that looks uh, like a eukaryotic embryo with apical cells and basal cells, and presumably the, all these cells are coated with an S layer. And how they maintain these interactions um, is something that's uh, very fascinating. Just to end, uh, they're not only of uh, fundamental biology interest, these S layers can be um, uh, utilized for synthetic biology um, applications. So this is from our collaborator, uh, Caroline Aho Franklin's group, who took our S layer structure from Colobacter crescentus, and they uh, engineered in a domain that binds to another S layer molecule, which basically you force the bacterium to make cell-cell interactions, converting these bacteria from a unicellular state to a multicellular state, which can make centimeter scale objects. So this is a direct application of this fundamental research into something that could be quite exciting in the future. Just uh, to end, I would like to say that surface molecules are extremely important because they allow cells to uh, uh, detect and respond to external stimuli. They also, through cell-cell interactions, shape uh, the formation of multicellular uh, communities like biofilms and microbiomes, and hopefully, um, we can go on and study how that occurs at the molecular and atomic level. All that's left to me is to thank again the Microbiology Society for giving me this award, and of course to the lab members who did the work. And I have to, uh, again, 
thank my host institutions, uh, the Dunn School of Pathology and MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, and also thank uh, some very generous collaborators and funders, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>